like in a bank or a financial institution have enough clout to engineer the overthrow of a foreign government is the financial establishment powerful enough that it could plan and execute the overthrow of a democratically elected government the answer to both questions is yes welcome to the why in history i am ajay kaur and today we are taking a look at financial coups not a military coup but a financial coup where the financial establishment was responsible for the overthrow of a government on december 17 1914 eight american marines stepped into the headquarters of haiti's national bank and walked out with $500,000 in gold packed in wooden boxes. American soldiers in civilian clothes kept watch as the Marines drove the loot by wagon to the shore. At the water, they loaded the boxes and sped to an awaiting gunboat. Within a few days, the gold was in the vault of the New York City's National City Bank, a.k.a. Citigroup. Wait, so the American Marines intervened on behalf of the National City Bank to rob Haiti's National Bank of its gold reserves? Yes, that is exactly what happened. But why? Well, in short, American bankers led by the National City Bank, raised fears with the U.S. government that Haiti would default on debt payments, despite the fact that it had been consistently complying. So to prevent that default, the best solution was to rob Haiti's gold reserves. And once it had Haiti's gold, the United States was able to control Haiti's government to a great extent. Haitians, though, saw this as robbery in broad daylight and were concerned about a potential threat to their sovereignty. The man behind this heist was National City Bank's Vice President, Roger Leslie Farnham. Farnham was an influential figure in Washington, D.C. circles. In fact, he was one of the individuals who had persuaded Congress to choose Panama for the site of the canal. And he had a good relationship with the Secretary of State, Jenny Bryans, under President Woodrow Wilson. Farnham was looking to expand National City Bank globally, starting with South America. And Haiti seemed to be the right choice because of its proximity as well as political and financial instability. There was one more factor at play, and that was World War I and France, which controlled Haiti's finances at that time, was busy with World War I. So Farnham pushed the State Department for an invasion of Haiti to secure American business interests. And the invasion had to lead to the takeover of the financial system, specifically Haiti's National Bank, which was still controlled by France as the majority stakeholder. And as Haitians had feared, Less than seven months after the Treasury heist, on June 28, 1915, U.S. Marines landed in Haiti and initiated a period of military rule that would last 19 years. In July of 1915, the Haitian president, Wilburn Sam, was assassinated after he ordered the execution of 167 political prisoners. And that gave the United States the justification to send the Marines to occupy Haiti so it could bring in peace and stability in the country and protect American interests. And as expected, within a month, Philippe Soudre d'Artiguenev was installed as president after he agreed to cooperate with the Americans. Within six weeks of the occupation, U.S. government representatives seized control of Haiti's custom houses, 
financial institutions and banks, national treasury, and subsequently, 40% of Haiti's national income was designated to repay debts to American and French banks. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson then decided to pursue the rewriting of the Constitution of Haiti. Yes, the American president wanted to rewrite the Constitution of a foreign country. The primary concern for the U.S. was the ban on foreigners from owning land in Haiti. A newly elected legislature of Haiti rejected the constitution proposed by the United States and instead started drafting a new constitution that was contrary to the interests of the United States. So what did the U.S. do? It sent one of its Marine commanders, Major Smedley Butler, to shut down the Senate proceedings and Major Butler got the Senate to shut down at gunpoint. The U.S. finally got its wish in 1918 when the new constitution was approved. But because of its opposition to the original proposal, Haiti remained without a legislative branch until 1929. And at this point, it is important to remember the name of Major Smedley Butler because he is going to feature again in another story in this episode. For National City Bank, Haiti proved to be a very profitable initiative. By 1922, National City Bank had secured complete control of the National Bank of Haiti and floated a $16 million loan, refinancing Haiti's internal and external debts. Amortization payments were effectively guaranteed from Haiti's custom revenue and the loan contract was backed up by the U.S. State Department. Once the Marines departed in 1934, National City Bank also followed because it was fearful of losing the State Department's protection. And the National Bank of Haiti was reluctantly sold to the Haitian government in 1935. January 6, 2021 was not the first coup attempt in the history of the United States of America. The first coup attempt was in 1933, and at that time, the primary sponsors of that attempt were prominent members of the Wall Street. 1933 was the peak of the Great Depression, where American economy had hit rock bottom. The stock market had crashed, unemployment was at 16 million and rising, and more than 5,000 banks had failed. And there were no government safety nets, no unemployment insurance, minimum wage, social security, or Medicare. And amongst all this chaos, Franklin Delano Roosevelt thought that government in a civilized society had an obligation to abolish poverty, reduce unemployment, and redistribute wealth. And as he took oath of office as the 32nd president of the United States, FDR came up with the concept, the New Deal, to tackle the aftermath of the Great Depression. And one of the key elements of his policy was the elimination of the gold standard in April of 1933. And this was primarily done to prevent bank runs so people could not demand to exchange their dollars into gold. But this infuriated the wealthiest individuals in the country because they were worried that if the US currency wasn't backed by gold, inflation could skyrocket and make their millions worth less. In short, they could end up being as poor as everybody else. So a plan was hatched to overthrow FDR and install a dictator who was more business friendly. And the reasoning was, well, it was working well in Italy under Mussolini. J.P. Morgan Jr., one of the richest men in the United States at the time, had secured a $100 million loan to Mussolini's government. J.P. Morgan Jr. refused to pay income tax and implored his peers to join him in undermining FDR. But to overthrow FDR, Wall Street was looking 
for a reliable and effective general who could lead a massive army of veterans. And the general, identified as being most apt for the job, was the Maverick Marine Major General Smedley Butler. Yes, the same Smedley Butler who shut down the Haiti legislature in 1915 at gunpoint. And the reason Smedley Butler was picked for this job was because he had himself claimed that during his 33 years in the Marines, he had spent most of his time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for bankers. In his own words, I was a racketeer for capitalism. Besides having had experience in toppling governments uh, on behalf of Wall Street, Smetley Butler was also a very well-known and respected figure among the veterans. Butler was approached by an American Legion member named Gerald Maguire and was told that the coup was backed by a group called the American Liberty League, which was a group of business leaders which was formed in response to FDR's victory. And their mission was to teach the government the necessity of respect for the rights of persons and property. And the members of this group included J.P. Morgan Jr., Irene Dupont, Robert Sterling Clark of the Singer Sewing Machines, and the chief executives of General Motors, Birdseye, and General Foods. Smedley Butler was to lead a massive army of veterans funded by $30 million from Wall Street. The weapons were to be supplied by Remington Arms, and Butler's directions were to march on Washington, oust FDR and the entire line of succession, and establish a fascist dictatorship backed by a private army of 500,000 veterans. Yep, that was the plan, to oust FDR and his entire line of succession. So what happened? Well, the plotters didn't realize that Butler, though a trusted and capable Marine, was very loyal to his own country and did not have any regard for Wall Street. So what did Butler do? He reported it to J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI. Subsequently, a congressional committee was tasked with investigating the coup attempt and it delivered its report in February 1935, which concluded that they had received evidence showing that certain persons had made an attempt to establish a fascist government in the country. Congressman John McCormack, who headed the congressional investigation, actually said that if General Butler had not been the patriot that he was, and if they had been able to maintain secrecy, the plot certainly might well have been successful. But Smedley Butler was very disappointed that the names of the country's richest men who had masterminded the plot had been removed from the final version of the committee's report. Wait, the coup masterminds were actually spared? Yes, it is believed that FDR actually struck a deal with the plotters, allowing them to avoid treason charges and possible execution if Wall Street backed off of its opposition to FDR's New Deal. The United Fruit Company, now known as Chiquita Brands International, controlled large swaths of land in Guatemala in the early 20th century. Guatemalan economy was heavily reliant on one product, bananas. And that gave it the term Banana Republic. Banana Republic ended up being a derogatory term often applied to poorer countries whose economies were based on a single crop. And in case of Guatemala, it was bananas. United Fruit dominated the banana industry in Guatemala and controlled 42% of Guatemalan land. And this included even Guatemala's telephone and telegraph systems. Wait, a fruit company 
was controlling Guatemala's telephone and telegraph systems? Yes. Guatemala was being ruled by a dictator, Jorge Ubico, and United Fruit had cozied up with him pretty well. And as a result, it was thriving in an environment of bribes, meager wages, and labor abuses. But all this changed in June 1944. The Guatemalans rose in rebellion and forced Ubico to resign after over a decade in power. And this led to the first legitimate elections in history of Guatemala, which ended up putting liberal reformers in power who had promised to introduce minimum wage, build schools and establish near universal suffrage. In 1951, Jacobo Arbenz became the second president of Guatemala and started the process of taking back control of the economy. And when the Arbenz administration passed Decree 900, the alarm bells went off at United Fruit. The aim of Decree 900 was to transfer underdeveloped land held by large property owners to landless farmers. And United Fruit, which owned nearly half of the country, was owning a huge chunk of the targeted land. Now, the point to note here is that the Guatemalan government did not seize the land. It paid for every acre that it took and it used valuation that the property owners had listed on their previous tax filings. But United Fruit had been undervaluing its holdings to avoid taxes. So at the end of 1952, Arbenz's administration had reclaimed 40% of the company's land at very little cost. But United Fruit had enough deep connections within the establishment so it was not going to be a mute bystander. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles was a former lawyer for United Fruit. His brother, Alan Dulles, was the director of CIA and a former board member at United Fruit. United Fruit's PR executive, Ed Whitman, was married to President Dwight Eisenhower's personal secretary, Ann Whitman. So under President Eisenhower's orders, the CIA began planning Operation PB Success in August of 1953. And the stated intention of Operation PB Success was to remove covertly the menace of the present communist-controlled government of Guatemala. Wait, communist-controlled? When? How? Well, it was 1953 and the early stages of the Cold War, so convincing the American president that there was a communist foe in a foreign country was not too difficult. The central character of the CIA operation was a disgruntled ex arbenz military officer named Carlos Castillo Armas. Armas rallied anti-government sentiment and put together an army of a few hundred men. And this group was supplied with US equipment and intelligence by the CIA. On June 18, 1954, Armas and his men attacked Guatemala with the help of logistical support from the US. The CIA launched a propaganda campaign warning the Guatemalan public and Arbenz that a major invasion was underway and they flooded the Guatemalan airwaves with highly exaggerated messages. American pilots were hired to bomb fortresses and other strategic points in Guatemala City and slowly the psychological warfare started succeeding as panic overtook the capital and Arbenz's supporters started losing faith in his leadership. Ultimately, on June 27, 1954, within nine days, Arbenz resigned and sought asylum at the Mexican embassy. The American officials were elated and hailed their victory as the victory of democracy over communism. The rest of the world, though, was disappointed and newspapers around the world condemned the Guatemalan coup, calling it economic colonialism. Castillo Armas took on the leadership mantle 
and promptly arrested several thousand opposition leaders, branded them as communists, and repealed the democratic constitution of 1945. Progressive reforms such as labor unions were dismantled and, most important of all, United Fruit was welcomed back in. United Fruit rebranded itself as Chiquita Brands International in 1984 and still sells bananas all over the world. It remains the leading distributor of bananas in the United States. And it is on that note that we end this section of the program. On to the quiz section. Question from the previous episode. Which countries are the top three holders of gold reserves in the world? Based on the third quarter 2023 snapshot, with 14,000 tons of gold reserves between them, the United States, Germany and Italy are the top three holders of gold reserves in the world today. So the answer is A, US, Germany and Italy. Question for the current episode. Who is considered to be the most influential Wall Street banker in history? Is it A, Alexander Hamilton? B. Charles Merrill, C. J.P. Morgan, or D. Amadeo Giannini. Once again, who is considered to be the most influential Wall Street banker in history? Is it A. Alexander Hamilton, B. Charles Merrill, C. J.P. Morgan, or D. Amadeo Giannini? The answer will be provided in the next episode. That's all we have in the current episode. In the next episode, we take a look at the origins, evolution, and growth of the most prominent tech hub in the US history, Silicon Valley. Till then, stay safe and keep exploring the why in history.